people in here are just starting no till or want to start? If you raise your hand, I'd like to know who I'm talking to. Good. We have quite a few that's, that's still wanting to start. Um, a little bit about myself. I started no till in 95. Um, basically, I'm um, a fourth generation farmer, and my dad was going out. There was, he thought there was no future in agriculture. He did not want me or my brothers to farm. He was adamant about it. He ran us all off. He got a hired man and finished out his career. When he quit, he, we have BIA trust land in our area, which are leases. And he gave some away, and I went and got him. I got him back. I went and got a cosine note. I bought a 750 John Deere drill, and I started farming. No matter what anybody else said, I was going to farm and I was going to no-till. I begged, borrowed, rented, everything else. Tractors, trucks, everything. I had a no-till drill. That was my piece of equipment. That and an old half-ton pickup. That was all I had. I wanted to farm. And this, that started the journey that, that I've ended up right here now. And it's been wonderful. I love to farm. I love to grow things. I love making my farms better. In case you don't know where Apache is, I'm about 200 miles straight northwest of here. A little bit about my farm. I farm about 3,000 acres of cropland and they're all subject to being planted up to two, two times a year. I plant primary crops, I plant secondary crops, and I plant cover crops. I am not afraid to plant stuff any time that I can get something planted or have time to make a crop. I've been in no-till for 19 years. Somebody's got to grow all this forage seed and cover crop seed that all you guys want to plant. Somebody's got to grow it. And that's the direction that I've taken is seed production. Almost everything I grow, somebody else is going to plant it at some point. I very, grow very little commodity grains. If I do, I, I farm store everything and I sell them off of the farm. I have no livestock. I've never had any livestock, ever. When I was growing up, everyone said you had to have livestock to carry the farming. What I discovered was everything was sacrificed for the cattle. The farming couldn't make any money because everything went to the cattle. When I got rid of the cattle, the farming became profitable then. Also, my niche in my area of not having any cattle made me different from everyone else. I got to rent the farms with no fences, no water, a uh, core of engineer land where cattle are completely restricted. All these other opportunities opened up to me because I was different. And that's what I've ended up with now. I've got a whole bunch of farms that are not conducive to livestock. But guys like Gabe and a few other guys, they've convinced me that the biology of the livestock on the land is going to enhance my cropping. If I can enhance my cropping by having cattle, I don't care if cattle make any money or not, I'm going to have cattle. And that's the point I'm at right now, is figuring out how to integrate cattle into my operation without destroying residue, because I have to have the residue to grow crops. I have to keep my ground covered. If I can figure out how to use my existing pastures and on my cropland, we're going to bring cattle in into the system. My goals, number one, is to make a profit. If I don't get to make money, none of this other stuff matters. All the clean water and clean air in the world for my neighbors and everybody else isn't going to do me any good if I cannot make some money at it. That is number one. That makes sure that I get to do it all again next year. The we, we have noble goals, and I 
I love to preserve the land. I love to make my farms better. I like doing all this, but I've got to make some money at it. Erosion, I want to totally eliminate erosion. I may not be able to, but that is my goal, is to completely eliminate it. If I don't have runoff my farms, I won't have erosion. That's what I'm looking for. I strive for 100% water efficiency. I do not want any runoff from my land, period. I want to run all that water through the plants. And being in seed production, I will not be as efficient as a forage system. I've got to use the first four, five, eight, nine inches of water before I get to the first pound of grain production. Forage is not that way. Forage, you get an inch of rain, you get so many pounds of forage. That's the most efficient use of water. And that's another reason I'm looking at, at grazing and using forage is, is to get my water efficiency higher than it is. I have farms that have been long-term no-till that have had, I can count the runoff events on one hand in the last five years. They just don't run water. Our cropping intensity is high enough, our infiltration rates are high enough that we can use all the water that we get. Another thing I'm really big on is almost every farm I rent, almost everything I had is rented. The only farms that I own are the ones I bought myself in the last few years. The farms are run down, they're degraded, they've been tilled to death, they're just in really poor shape and it just aggravates me to death when I take over a new farm and I have to go through this whole process of bringing it back up, bringing it back to life, getting a lime on it, building the fertility back up, and getting it where I can actually make some money on it. All these goals, and it's like everybody else has said, the ground has to be covered. Bare ground is the kiss of death in my country. In the summertime, the temperature difference, the surface temperature between covered ground and bare ground can be 60, 70 degrees difference. That well, Gabe was talking about that 140 degrees that kills the biology. It can easily go over 140 degrees in the summertime. It just, it just has to be covered at all times. This is what it's all about. That is a six foot moisture probe. It's all the way in the ground. My soils will hold anywhere, my poorest soils will hold four to six inches of stored moisture. My best soils will hold 10 to 12 inches, maybe 13 inches. My organic matter on most of my farms have gone up about one to one and a half percent up from where I started. My best farms are around 3% right now, and there's just worlds and worlds of difference between one and a half and 3%. It's the difference between a really good farm and just an average farm. You can see the, this is after a cover crop. You can see everything is froze down. This is in the winter time. I'll have short fallow periods, sometimes to gather moisture up. If I'm going to be intending to plant corn, I would like to have a short fallow period to gather moisture up. If I'm, if I'm planted a shallow rooted, low moisture use crop, it's not such a big deal. I can run a cover crop right up to the end and then plant something like the millet. <laughs> Talking about the erosion part of it, this is my home farm. It's where my great grandpa came a long, long time ago. I recently bought it from my parents. <clears throat> this is a pond that drains approximately 35 acres of crop ground and about 40 acres of pasture. That's silt. I'm standing on about four more feet of silt. That since 1948 to just last year, that farm had thousands and thousands of yards, of cubic yards of silt in it, just off that small part of that 160 acres. 
And it's just, it's just amazed me how much dirt went down the, down the drain. Fortunately, it stayed on the farm. I reclaimed all of this and took it back out of the farm. But it's just amazing that such a small area could erode so much. And my, my dad had, had a whole wall full of conservation awards. A wall full of them. And this still happens. This is happening today, too. This is what I want to eliminate. This is one of the cover crop mixes that we use. For me, my second crops come first, and the cover crops come when I, I don't have time for a second crop. This is uh, about an eight-way mix, I believe. There's some brassicas in here. There's uh, warm season grasses, sunflowers. This was after a very severe drought. We got a rain the first of August. I jumped in and planted it, and then it turned off 100 degrees for the next month. Never rained again. And this is where, after 45 days, we had an early frost. All the warm season parts of this are all gone. And the cool season part portion of the mix kept alive. This is another 15 days later. And this is at the point where I decided to terminate. I figured the turnips and the radishes and everything were big enough, as big as they were going to get. We're in the middle of a horrendous drought. I decided to terminate right there and follow the winter and go to grain stores and with it. It's, it's hard to get the drought thing out of your mind, you know, which, which rain is going to be your last rain. And sometimes, some of the part portions of my rotations will be more conservative water-wise than other parts. I'll go for broke on some portions, some fields, and kind of hold back on other fields so I don't get caught flat food with everything in the same basket. <laughs> This is another, this was a, a little test plot right behind my house. I actually run through it with a mower so I can take some decent pictures of what it looks like on the interior. When you take pictures from the outside, they always look good. You get on the inside to look, look at everything. But there's, there's buckwheat in there, there's cow peas, there's, there's just all kinds of stuff in there. It's just a, a beautiful little plot. We uh, planted this, uh, the next year this went to a, a grain sorghum variety trial and we had several several varieties in this past summer that went over 150 and 160. It, it did really well. This, this plot is in wheat right now. But all this is, if you're not familiar with this stuff, it's, it's always good to start on a small scale. But for me, it's a garden. I have a garden, and then I have about a two-acre test plot. And it's where I try new things. It's where I figure out what works, what doesn't work, how to do it, when to do it. And it, it keeps you from making costly mistakes when you can try something on a small scale. This is one of my second crops. These are cow peas. Um, we grow cow peas, lung beans, several different kinds of millets, um, buckwheat, uh, open pollinated corn, just all kinds of stuff. But the reason I put this picture in here is these were planted after we, we whenever we've got good, good cover on the soil, we can hold moisture at planting depth for typically months on end. We can hold it at, at, at planting depth until we're ready to, ready to plant. And this, these were planted. We had a decent rain after harvest. They were planted and it did not rain again for three months. And that is only off stored moisture. The, the entire growth is off stored moisture and it never rained. Of course, it is hot food. But this is some of my better land. It is good stored moisture. And when it comes to cow peas and other kind of low-use water crops, 
we can grow a crop without a drop of rain. If we've got if we've got good soil moisture, we can uh, typically grow. It won't be a great crop, but we can grow something on it. This is typical of, of stuff that I plant into. Um, this is uh, actually planting cotton into rye. This was a, we didn't get the whole thing. I never take enough pictures. And my wife says I'll never take them right either. But uh, we, we rolled, actually, we knocked part of this down and we left part of it standing. And I'm convinced in our country, if you're planting in the springtime, it's a great benefit to keep the wind off the small plants. And for me, it's like this, I want to keep that, that residue upright and I want to keep the wind off the plant. Cold, more, or cold, wet soils like they have up north are not a concern for me at all. Hot, dry soils are my concern. Here's another one. This is uh, grain sorghum stubble, planting wheat into it. It's real typical of, of stuff that I'll plant into. I know grazers look at that and say, oh, I can get so many pounds of gain off of that. And I look at it as I'm feeding my soil, feeding my soil biology. But I think there is still, there could still be a benefit to using cattle in the system. And every once in a while I do things that make my neighbors scratch their heads. Uh, this is my home farm in the background. And this field went from directly from native grass to Bermuda grass. They dished it up, sprigged it about 45 years ago. And I decided I'm going to farm it. So I'm planting corn into the Bermuda grass sod. And uh, we're in the middle of the drought. And I did get a stand. It was awfully dry last winter and spring with both. But uh, it started raining last summer, and that field actually made about 113 bushel corn. Our uh, county average is about 50. And it was just amazing where the best Bermuda grass was is where the best corn was. There was there was a lot of biology going on in that field. There were a few places we did a little dirt work, had some bare ground. It made no corn at all. The plants actually died anywhere the ground was bare. Here's another example. This would be uh, double cropping mung beans uh, into uh, wheat stubble. We have a stripper head on all the wheat, all the small grains. <coughs> A good portion of this stubble will still be standing after the drill goes by. Um, anyway, that's just that's some of the equipment that I use. I use this thing also to put fertilizer down with. If we get a new farm, sometimes the, the fertility is not good at all, and we'll use this to put fertilizer in to keep as we can run it. We'll line it. We got mine and gypsum just a few miles from my home. We've got our own spreader. New verbal rate spreading. Uh, the pH is a, is a big deal in our country with lots and lots of low pH ground. And that's why we have low pH ground. We have a good lime source just a few miles away. It's beyond me. Nobody will lime rented ground in our country for some reason. And I've been known to do other things like this. I don't know how many people want to come bail this for me. And uh, I just tell them I'm feeding my soil biology and you think I'm a nut. <laughs> this actually is some Indian trust, or BIA trust land. I shouldn't say Indian, it's Native American. Uh, BIA trust land where planting a second crop is $50 an acre fine. So we cover crop them. And uh, this was sort of sedan planted into wheat stubble, and now I'm putting cowpeas into it, and then it went to cotton the next year. We needed a really 
durable residue that would last all the way through till cotton harvest the next year. And that's why I got some big, high carbon, something that would last good. And this is uh, the same field earlier. This is cotton and rice stubble. Um, I, I have never seen cotton with cotyledon leaves as big as these. They were big as the palm of your hand. It was like they were growing in the greenhouse. They weren't beat up by the wind or anything. Anyway, this, this was a farm I had just bought the year before, basically an abandoned, eroded farm. And we ended up making about 800 pound cotton on it. This is grain sorghum. We do we do quite a bit of grain sorghum and uh, wheat stubble as a second crop. Uh, we go red and white both. A lot of it goes into the uh, bird seed market. But that's just another example of getting those plants down out of the wind and uh, keeping that hot dry wind off of them. And that is really my favorite.